Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies over here in Honolulu. And uh, we're trying to get ready for the next legislative session, which surprisingly happens right after the midterm elections. So we're, we're never, never uh, a dull moment in Hawaii getting ready for legislation. So got a special guest today, uh, Representative Chris Lee from uh, the state legislature, House of Representatives on my side of the island, no less. So I get to rub shoulders with him and honk my horn at him when I drive by him in the morning waving his signs and stuff. And uh, he gives us some uh, great support, especially on the energy side here in Hawaii. He's very active, he's, um, he's on top of all the legislation. So I asked him if he could come in today and participate on the show and give us some insight coming up on next session. So Rep Lee, good to have you here. Thanks for having me back. No, I know you're always on Think Tech, so I'm just happy to be <laughs> one of the shows that you, you can clear some time. You're the only show, okay. you're my priority show, let me okay. put it that way. Okay. <laughs> So what's going on with uh, the legislature uh, this year? What do you th what do you think is going to be coming up? <clears throat> yeah. So um, well, just to step back for a second, put it in context. You know, we're what two weeks out from the election now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so that'll determine a handful of the races that are that are outstanding right now. But I think what we expect, uh, no matter what, is that there's going to be a huge number of new elected legislators this year. At least maybe ten or eleven mm -hmm. in the House, um, a few in the Senate, and that means uh, two things. One uh, the dynamics in the legislature have an opportunity to shift a little bit and have a bit new discussion uh, and see things from new perspectives. And secondly, um, it means that there's a lot of education which needs to happen between right. now and then, particularly when it comes to energy and a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about. So um, that's your that's your your homework from now till okay. January to get started. But what it also means is that you know we're going in for another year of um, continuing on our progress toward. Our, our transformation of our energy future and, and electrification of transportation and all the things that we've been working on collectively. Mm -hmm. So this past year, you know, we had really, um, I think, taken some big steps. Uh, we passed our bill, which um, made Hawaii the first state in the country to uh, commit to a zero emissions clean economy mm -hmm. down the road. And that uh, really reinforces our commitment to transforming transportation, especially. Uh, and all four counties now are on board with zeroing out emissions by 2045 to do our part here, uh, as well as, especially with some of the new models coming on the market, um, EVs and hydrogen vehicles, uh, being able to help uh, proliferate that new technology, which can ultimately save consumers a whole lot of money in the long run. So um, building off of that, I think, is what we're going to try and do this year. And not knowing yet exactly what the composition of the legislature is going to look like come January, I think it's safe to say, though, that uh, the direction's still going to be, uh, we're still going to be moving ahead in that direction. Mm -hmm. And it's just a question of, like, what are the specific next steps based on who's elected and, and all the rest. But what's really exciting, you know, I, and I don't want to get too far off the tangent here, but I was just in California. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about your trip. Yeah, it was great. You know, I've been up there a few times to the Bay Area, working with our counterparts, our legislators in, in Sacramento, as well as um, the California Public Utilities Commission and the, the California Energy Commission, and a lot of the stakeholders in the Bay Area that also are here in Hawaii. Um, folks like Tesla and ProTerra mm -hmm. and, and companies like that. Um, and so for us, we've really been trying to figure out how in Hawaii our policies and the success that we're seeing on our energy transformation can apply elsewhere. Because ultimately, you know, if Hawaii does everything it can and we're 100% renewable and clean tomorrow, it means nothing for our climate goals if nobody else comes along with us worldwide. Right, right. And it means very little to serve as sort of the test bed for a lot of this really cool, transformative, innovative um, energy technology if it means it's not going to actually be implemented and scalable elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So we're in California working with our colleagues um, over the past few years to help them out. Uh, and, and they've got a lot of great initiatives going on their own as well. But we were there two weeks ago in the Bay Area uh, with Governor Jerry Brown and with Kevin DeLeon, who's one of my um, legislative colleagues we've mm -hmm. been working with, as the governor signed into law their 100% RPS for California. 
um, directing California to be 100 percent renewable by 2045. It's nice to finally beat California at something. Oh, I know. And you know what? They were so eager uh, uh, to, to really take credit for being the first state. And it, it's a friendly competition. Yeah. But we had to remind them, you know, we were there three years ago. Yeah, we're way ahead of them. <laughs> yeah. So um, what's really exciting about that, though, is that, you know, California, California is the fifth largest economy on the planet. Yep. And so Hawaii being out front of this, putting our RPS in place, and and taking the next steps to actually implement and, and create this viable clean energy uh, electric grid and hopefully transportation grid down the road means that Hawaii is proving that that transformation is possible anywhere. If we can do it in Hawaii on our limited volatile electric grids, it can be done anywhere. California now proves as the fifth largest economy that that transformation is inevitable everywhere. And so it's really exciting to see our two states really work hand in hand to try and transform um, the entire uh, energy paradigm, not only in the United States, but around the world. And so we've got uh, about a half a dozen other states right now we're working with, uh, Washington, Massachusetts, and, and a number of others, and other countries we're partnering with, too, on the policy front to really figure out how we can collectively move forward as a society, as um, a global economy, and make this transformation work for everyone. Well, you know, California puts a lot of money into what they're doing over there especially relative to the amount that we, we seem to be doing in Hawaii. How, how can we improve that, that scenario? How can we basically take the re resources that we do have and uh, with all the competing things in the legislature that are vying for those resources, start spending a little bit more to get new things started in Hawaii that probably would take us even further faster, but the, the industry needs a little bit of incentive, not a whole lot, and not a feed off the trough forever kind of thing, but get them get them kick started into the into the clean energy realm. No, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I think we've we've done a lot of work aligning everybody in the same direction and got our goals in place and a lot of the mechanisms to continue that progress. But funding is um, key to be able to implementing a lot of these things. So uh, I think that's what's coming this year is the question of how do we do that. You know, just stepping back for a second, partnering with big states like California that have you know, billions of dollars invested in these kinds of um, efforts. Excuse me, I almost got a sneeze. Um, it's authorized. You can. Sneeze. I know, <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, they've got tremendous amounts of resources that right. we don't have. So being able to leverage that in partnership, because we're we're honestly asking a lot of the same questions when it comes to trying to figure out our direction. Mm -hmm. About eighty percent, maybe, right? Not not entirely overlap, but we can share. And that also means resource share. So while they're investing in um, uh, electric vehicle infrastructure and hydrogen infrastructure and all the things that make the proliferation of these new technologies viable, we can do the same thing here in concert. And so that's one of the avenues that we want to take. But more locally, to uh, bring that back home, we also need to make investments on behalf of the state and the counties into um, stuff right here in our own backyard. And so I think there's a couple revenue streams that have been talked about in the last few years. You know, looking at the barrel tax, for example, which is the revenue stream we get about $50 million off of all the imported fossil fuels, and using a slice of that to really invest in the innovative technology that has a nexus so that we can use the revenues from what we want to get away from to fund the investments that are going to allow people to move away from it to cheaper alternative innovative technologies like hydrogen and electric vehicles, for example. Yeah, we've been talking, Rachel and I have been talking to Gwen over at the, the she's handling the GEMS program and she's looking at some initiatives to expand some of the funding streams available mm -hmm. besides GEM, but things that she could possibly manage from DBED to help um, manage that um, funding for startups and new technologies that can help us get there. So yeah. I think you'll probably be talking to her this session too. Uh, she's got some good ideas. Well, what are some of the things that uh, you've seen from the last legislature that you think might get carried forward into this legislature and we ought to be working on or looking at or you know helping with? Um, well, the, the thing that comes to mind most is um, got a finite timeline to it. Our um, Incentives for electric vehicles, which apply both to fuel cell vehicles and straight battery electric vehicles. Um, that allows anybody to be able to drive in the HOV lane or park um, in, in certain areas for reduced prices or for free. Those incentives, which um, is our state's version of trying to help the industry right. and help consumers, 
whereas other states are giving just direct cash supplements mm -hmm. and subsidies uh, to people. Those are about to expire in 2020. Mm -hmm. They're going to sunset. And so that means the legislature has to take action to decide what sort of incentive it wants to put forward. It may come in the form of a direct extension of those existing um, benefits, or it could come in the form of uh, additional subsidy, or some mix of the two. So that's something that has to be decided relatively quickly. So that's coming back for sure. Okay. I, I've been watching the plug-in electric vehicle charging station issue for several years now with, with the energy office downtown. And um, the one thing that's that I've kind of noticed is as we try and build a plug-in um, charging infrastructure, we're running into situations where, especially in condominiums or large buildings, the service to the building isn't sufficient to add a bunch of chargers to the building without adding infrastructure. Yeah. Well, adding infrastructure means HECO gets to charge the people in that building more money to put in more transformers and things like that. And, and you know, the more people I talk to, the more that seems to be stifling all the efforts to try and do more charging stations. Is there, is there anybody working on that? You know, there, that, that is sort of the crux of the issue because for half the folks who live in condos and apartments and um, want to put in even just PV panels uh, and battery storage, I mean, this is a huge problem. How do you pay for the common area mm -hmm. electrical upgrades that enable all the individuals to take advantage? And so um, we've been working with other states to figure out how they've approached this, because in Hawaii we haven't figured out an answer yet. We've had a, a working group that came together um, last year and the year before that, and they didn't really find a good way to pay for it that was viable. And so one of the things that California and other states have done is basically figured out how to create additional new revenue streams specifically dedicated to that question. And so in Hawaii, one of the tools we have uh, that's being considered is how do you, for example, leverage, um, whether it's through the barrel tax or some other um, uh, carbon-based offset uh, revenue stream that can help pay for these improvements because it's a benefit not only for consumers but for all the uh, folks who are going to be occupying those units in the future. Um, and it's just fascinating. You, you look at, there's a great example in Kaka'ako right now, a lot of the new uh, apartment buildings, the towers that have come up. Um, on average, I'm fudging the numbers just a little bit because uh, I don't remember the exact, but I'm rounding them off. But it's something in the magnitude of a, roughly about 1000 to $1,500 to put in uh, the electrical capacity to put in an EV charging uh, port in your typical stall, vehicle mm -hmm. stall. Um, when you're building the building brand new, when you're building it in after the fact to an existing unit, it could be as much as fourteen to fifteen thousand right. dollars to do the same thing. So it really makes sense to really tackle this stuff up front. Mm -hmm. California um, has, I keep referencing California because um, they're our closest neighbor, but uh, they most recently enacted a uh, policy which says that a certain percentage of all new electric or all new parking stalls and new buildings have to be pre-wired for EVs or fuel cell vehicles, whatever it is that, that um, is going to uh, take power to, to charge. And so um, that's something that we started to look at. We had a conversation about uh, just at the tail end of the legislature last year. So I think that'll come up again because ultimately it just saves everyone money in the long run. Yeah, that seems like a more palatable solution when you have to, rather than going back to an existing community in a building and saying, okay, we're going to assess you all to put in two more charging stations that mm -hmm. are like, wait a minute, I don't have an electric car. If I was getting something out of it, why should I have to pay for something mm -hmm. that I don't use? But if you're building a building and you build it into the building, it becomes part of the cost of the, of the apartment divided by 100 or however many people right. are buying apartments. Right. And then it's kind of in, invisible to them. They, they are contributing and it's probably the fairest way to do it and the right way to do it, but yeah, it's not as painful. Yeah. Especially trying to convince people after the fact, on top of the fact that it's like 10 right. times more expensive. Right. And the avoided than, alternative, unfortunately, especially for folks who live in buildings now like that, that were built you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, long before EVs were a thing, um, have very few options. You know, they're going to pay a lot of money to put this in, which means in just three or four years' time when EVs and um, uh, other things are actually cheaper to produce than gas cars, they're going to be stuck because they won't have that opportunity to charge at home, which means they're going to have their transportation costs artificially kept high. That cost of living is going to be there for them where other people are going to be able to lower it. And that's something that we have to be cognizant of, which is why we're making or trying to make these upfront investments. Yeah.
Okay, we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be back with Chris Lee to talk about some of the other things going on in the legislature and energy in the state of Hawaii in about 60 seconds. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pumai Weigert and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m. and we hope we'll see you next time. Hey, welcome back to Stand the Energy Man again on my lunch hour. I need to say that, especially with the House of Representatives in the House, so that they know I'm not mooching on state time while I'm here doing this show and getting my absor exorbitant fee for speaking here. <laughs> we're all we're all volunteer hosts, so don't worry about it. This doesn't cost the state anything. Thanks, Rep, for being here. And we were talking on the break a little bit about. Um, Kind of one of the good deals that made it through last session, which is the folks that live in condominiums and apartments, if, if they could put two solar panels on their lanai, they sure wouldn't get much of a tax credit. So the legislature handled that kind of in a unique way. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Laws um, that came into being? Yeah, and great to be here. I'm also here as a volunteer, <laughs> uh, unless there's a check coming that I don't know about. But uh, uh, yeah, this, was, you know, this is an issue that's been discussed for about the better part of a decade now. And it's to enable apartment dwellers, condo owners, renters, folks who don't have access to rooftops to put solar on their own home, to be able to take advantage in the same way and ultimately save money the same way. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we've had bills introduced in the legislature, I think as early as 2012, 2013, uh, to enable this to happen. And the utilities had opposed it for the longest time. And so just uh, in the last, uh, I think, two years, we, three years maybe, we passed a bill that, that required the PUC to open up a docket and figure this out. And so the PUC has gone through that process. It's been um, uh, a very long, technical, drawn out process, but finally um, we're at a point where these programs are deploying and people are, for the first time, very shortly going to be able to uh, buy into off-site PV and get credit as though it's on their own roof, even though they may live in an apartment building. Mm -hmm. So it's really exciting because it opens up the market to a whole new group of people who previously couldn't participate. So that would be like an independent power producer buying a tract of land and putting solar on it and offering shares? Yeah, like basically, a basically, yeah. So you could buy into like uh, you know a set number of panels in a project that might be off in uh, Waianae or Wahiwa or, or wherever, even though you live in Waikiki, right. for example. Well, that's great. Yeah, it's exciting. And this is something that is not new. We're almost the only state at this point that doesn't do it. Uh, states like Minnesota and others figured it out you know, almost a decade ago. And it's just really simple and easy way to empower people and, and give them new alternative options for, for electricity. That's something that um, I think it's, we're way past time catching up on, but finally glad to see that we're almost here. I know it's not a state project, but the rail project is always fun to talk about. Oh yeah, especially, let's dive in. Especially, <laughs> especially when you want to. This is a four-hour program, right? right. <laughs> I, um, you know, yesterday I was out in Waihua or Waipahu actually talking to some Toyota folks um, about forklifts, hydrogen forklifts, and sure enough, there was a train up on the rail doing a little bit of you know practice, moving around and doing stuff by that station, and so the, it's coming. It's it's like on its way, but um, you know that thing is notoriously gone pretty well over budget and. And it creates its own economic impact for the state overall. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think we're going to get ahead on that, working with the county to, to make sure that that thing comes to fruition? I'm convinced that once it's up and you give it a chance, that it's, it's, people are going to really like it. No, a ridership will eventually get up and everything. But it's awful painful right now, especially as we look at how do we pay for it. What are some of the things that the state's looking at? You know, um, from the states, so first of all, it's important to 
to point out, this is a county-led project, yeah, right? Yeah, and so Heart is a creature of the right. city and county of Honolulu. Exactly. Um, from the state side, all we did was authorize the financing to be able to help pay for this. Mm -hmm. uh, we were promised that it was going to be on time and on budget, and it's over double budget. <clears throat> <Yeah>. <laughs> it hasn't been delivered in the way we expected. Yeah. Let's suffice it to say. But you know, I mean, along the way. Um, one of the things that we also had discussed, because we get updates every couple of years from, um, from the city on what's going on with the project, you know, we had, I remember, uh, maybe this is like four or six years ago now, in one of those updates, um, all our legislators were assembled and uh, Hart was there presenting uh, the latest on what's going on. And we asked them, you know, when it comes to energy use, the operational cost of running a rail system that is 100% electric is enormous. Yeah. You know, if you look at almost every other city around the country, where you have, or around the world, frankly, where you have um, similar sorts of trains and mass transit, those operational costs have to be subsidized because ultimately, yes. fares from people riding just can't cover that enormous yeah. cost. But yet, we're building us at a point where technology has changed. All these systems that were built 10, 20, 30 years ago didn't have the opportunity that we have today to take advantage of um, or renewables that could power mm -hmm. uh, our, our own rail system here. And so Hart at the time had come forward and its representatives had said, you know, it's something we're absolutely looking into, we're, we're diving in, and um, you know, today there's almost nothing going on, at least that I'm aware of on that, unfortunately. And so that's, that's really frustrating because yeah. I feel like it is one of the projects that could absolutely benefit from the kinds of off-the-shelf technology that yeah. everyone else is using to save on costs. Yeah, you could maybe hang solar panels on the south side of the rail itself and just collect solar. I mean, the thing's already there, so it's not going to break anybody's view or anything. It's, oh, absolutely. it's hanging there. Absolutely. So, and that could be a lot of solar panels. I mean, that being said, like, I think it's, you know, we're at a point where we have to build this out and, and hopefully create a yeah. network and a system like most other cities have that can get you from point A to B, not just in a straight line, mm -hmm. but you can get to C, D, E, wherever you need to go. But it needs to be done right. And I think there's a lot of frustration that, that the project's not being executed as well as it yeah. should be. And the planning and, and so forth is, um, it's gone off the rails a little bit. Yeah, but, no, pun uh, no pun intended. No pun intended. But hopefully, uh, you know, if it comes up again this year, because uh, it looks like the city is going to be short on funding again, yeah. um, hopefully we can, we can hold our feet to the fire and, and figure out how we can do all these things that are just so yeah. common sense that... Well, you do a lot of traveling, and so do I. And I've ridden on the DC Metro a lot, and San Francisco, uh, BART, and everything. And it's it's a really great system. And most people don't understand up front that they don't make money. Those systems never make money. I mean, they're they're made so that people don't drive their cars. They're made to save the population money mm -hmm. by not having to operate vehicles, and especially take care of folks who don't have high wage jobs that need to get from YOR or Waipau into town to do go to work and not have to get them in traffic. But also hopefully we'll be pulling a lot of cars off the road, especially from West Oahu. That means we don't have the pollution. We'll have actually more efficient vehicles because they'll operate at their efficient range instead of stop and go at 10 miles an hour on the freeway for an hour. They can actually just move where they're designed to drive at 50 or 60 miles an hour and burn fuel more efficiently until we get them off the fuel and into electricity. Yeah, that's an important point. I think it's, it's often overlooked in, in a lot of the analysis, but I mean, a, a, a well-planned, designed, and executed mass transit system, in this case rail, does have the opportunity to overall save consumers, taxpayers, a significant amount of money because you're just reducing the volume of investment that people have to make individually into cars, insurance, all the other things. And that's money that stays in their pocket and goes out into the economy in other ways, creating new businesses and jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And so for, um, especially I think our next generation growing up in Hawaii, you know, I'm, I'm 37 now, and um, I graduated from high school in 1999. And our age group You're at scary. that time, <laughs> well, yeah, there's a lot of jokes I can make. But um, before I do that, you know, our age group in 1999 of um, uh, 18 to 29-year-olds, uh, you know, 99% of us had driver's licenses at that time. Mm -hmm. Today, that same age group, less than 65%. I was going to say almost half, probably. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. changing so dramatically. Yeah. And that's, I think, a good thing, mm -hmm. because it means people are, are living more sustainably, they're, they're living closer to work, they're, they're finding alternatives to, to paying the high cost of actual car ownership and everything that comes with it. 
And ultimately, that's one of the only ways that, especially for our generation, we're going to be able to live here. Mm -hmm. Because having an entire um, mortgage plus car payment plus insurance plus all the rest of it and wasting you know, two hours a day and commuting from town to Eva or wherever it is, mm -hmm. It's just, that is a 20th century lifestyle that yeah. needs to go away. Yeah, it's not sustainable. Nobody wants that. Yeah. So um, it's about making the right investments in the kinds of projects that can provide those alternatives and a cheaper cost of living yeah. overall. Yeah, but the whole reduced vehicle miles traveled piece is often forgotten about. That's right. We talk about That's right. So hey, one of the things we did talk on the break a little bit about was Beaky. And um, how, how do you view that as in terms of an in-town solution that maybe could be deployed to other neighborhoods and neighbor islands and things. Yeah, you know, um, most of the folks I know downtown that work downtown have memberships, and mm -hmm. instead of getting in a car and driving six or eight blocks or further to a meeting to find a parking place, to yeah, and the whole thing, it's mm -hmm. faster and yeah. way more convenient to just go downstairs, hop on a, a bike, uh, head down the bike lane, you know, a few blocks, and you're at your meeting, you park it, and you're done. You don't have to worry about any of that other traffic and all the crap that comes with it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's something that I think has been enormously empowering in a way for sort of the folks living in the urban core and working in the urban core. I hope that other communities are able to take advantage of either Beaky or something similar. And now there's a lot of things going on. I was just in uh, Santa Monica uh, for a, a work trip. And there, you not only have bike share, but you've also got scooters, electric scooters. We've seen a few of those here in town, um, and people just use them everywhere, and they're so convenient and so easy. They've replaced a lot of the vehicular transit, which has opened up um, enormous opportunities for new businesses to open up along the sides of streets, mm -hmm. and for taking uh, what used to be vehicle lanes and turning them into park spaces and uh, places where folks can open up little kiosks and do all kinds of neat, innovative stuff in a way that was never possible before. Yeah. Well, we're coming up on the end of our time here, and I've spent 29 minutes not talking about hydrogen, which is really <laughs> out of character. So I'm going to ask you where you see hydrogen taking its place in Hawaii, especially in Honolulu. Yeah, you know, I think um, that hydrogen will play a role here for sure in the in the coming future. You know, we've already got our first hydrogen fueling station down at Servco, which is exciting, and they've got vehicles driving around now. But more than that, as a, a fuel storage uh, battery, where you can take a PV project and instead of plumbing into batteries, which are pretty expensive to put in, you can generate hydrogen, store it, use it for other things, transport it around. And there's a lot of opportunities there to do mm -hmm. um, a whole new kind of energy uh, load storage. shifting and mm -hmm. storage and all the rest of it. Yeah. And that's something that's exciting. Great. HECO seems to be focused on battery, though. Are they actually looking at hydrogen from your perspective? I know there are people who are. Um, I, I don't know in HECO's latest um, uh, filings what, what is in there. Yeah, they just announced about 250 megawatts worth of storage mm -hmm. projects on three different islands, yeah. but none of them included hydrogen. So I'm just wondering if you, you know your interface with them, they're even looking that direction right now. There are people who are looking at it. I think um, and even HNEI and some of the other institutes are looking at it because there's there's a there's a, a price point at which it becomes viable to do, right? right? And there, there are cir circumstances where you have curtailed energy exactly. that can be used exactly. to generate hydrogen and stored. I mean, it's otherwise going to be lost. Yeah. So um, relative, especially for large-scale storage, um, hydrogen is exceptionally efficient because you don't need, like, you know, banks and banks and banks right. of batteries. You just need a bigger tank. Right. So that's something that I think is um, encouraging for the future. Well, great. Well, I ran us right up to the last second of our show here. And I want to thank you again for being on the show. Thanks for having me. And uh, sharing some of your thoughts with us. And uh, that's it for today. We'll see you next week on Friday. Thanks to Robert and Cindy here in the studios for helping all the magic happen. And we'll see you next week. Aloha.